a brother Luke, Sin City preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight I am continuing the study on the book of Ecclesiastes, and I'm going to uh, pick up where I left off last time, uh, beginning with chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, if you have not seen the previous studies on Ecclesiastes, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Uh, the other uh, previous chapters are uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, now, I'm a KJV firstist, so I'm going to read it first in the KJV, and I may also look at it in the Amplified. Sometimes I find that to be helpful. Chapter 8, verse 1, Ecclesiastes. Who is as the wise man, and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. <clears throat> well, who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? Well, that certainly is a, a good question. Uh, the interpretation of a thing, well, let's apply that to the scriptures. Uh, many people misinterpret the scriptures. And what I'm attempting to do now is read them and interpret them as best I can. And if we're wise, if we study the scriptures and we have wisdom, then <clears throat> maybe we can get it right. Uh, but it says a, a, a man's wisdom maketh his face to shine and the boldness of his face shall be changed. It certainly is true. As we gain wisdom, as we understand the scriptures, uh, it's a, it's a joyful thing. Every every time that um, the scriptures are open to me, uh, God reveals the meaning of the scriptures to me. Uh, yeah, I'm my face shines with happiness. I'm I'm just overjoyed, especially when I read a scripture that I've read many times in the past, and I all of a sudden there's a a revelation, an epiphany that I finally get it. Let me see how this is phrased in the Amplified. It says, who is like the wise man and who knows the interpretation of a matter? A man's wisdom illumines his face and causes his stern face to beam. Okay, now let's look at verse 2 in the KJV. It says, I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment and that in regard of the oath of God uh, in the Amplified it phrases it this way. I counsel you to keep the commandment of the king because of the oath before God by which you swore loyalty to him. Of course, this is written by a king, King Solomon. Uh, verse 3, be not hasty to go out of his sight stand not in an evil thing for he doeth whatsoever he pleaseth hmm. in the amplified it says do not be in a hurry to get out of his presence do not join in a malevolent matter for the king will do whatever he pleases um i guess it's in uh, it's a polite warning you know, the king doesn't have the power to do whatever he wants. And if you violate his wishes, if you break an oath to the king, I imagine there will be hell to pay. Verse 4, where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? Are you going to challenge a king? Do you dare? <laughs> Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing. That's the commandment of the king. <clears throat> and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Hmm. So if you're wise, you do the right thing at the right time. Let's see how it's phrased in the Amplified. Uh, whoever keeps and observes a royal command will experience neither trouble nor misery. For a wise heart will know the proper time and appropriate procedure. Well, whether it's a king, uh, in the, like in the days of Solomon, or whether it's just uh, whatever 
governmental authorities that you live under now, you better obey the laws. Uh, if you break the laws, uh, there's there's stiff penalties. Um, verse 6 in the KJV says, Because to every purpose there is time and judgment, therefore the misery of a man is great upon him. For he knoweth not that which shall be, for who can tell him when it shall be? Hmm. The Amplified says, for no one knows what will happen. So who can tell him how and when it will happen? Of course, God knows, but no man knows unless God reveals it to him in prophecy. And in this book here, it's filled with prophecies. God wrote down the history in advance. Uh, there's hundreds of, of clear prophecies in the Bible that were written and then they were fulfilled exactly as it said, maybe decades, centuries later. Verse, um, verse 8, There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in that war, neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. <clears throat> In the Amplified, it says, There is no man who has power and authority over the wind to restrain the wind, nor does he have authority over the day of death. Of course, you could kill yourself, and in that way, you, uh, you're taking control over your own death, but then that doesn't change a thing because God knew it in advance. Uh, there is no discharge from service during time of war, and evil will not rescue those who actively seek to practice it. Verse 9 in the KJV says, All this have I seen and applied my heart unto every work that is done under the sun. So under the sun is everything that's happened around the world. Uh, he says, he's saying, I've seen everything. Uh, there, there is a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his own hurt. <clears throat> so sometimes you control others and it ends up costing you. If you do have authority of someone, be, be fair and be just. Otherwise, uh, being unjust may come back to haunt you. Uh, let's see how it says that in the uh, Amplified. Verse 9, All this have I seen while applying my mind to every deed that is done under the sun. There is a time in which one man has exercised power over others to their detriment. And in the KJV, verse 10 says, uh, And so I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity. Hmm. The Amplified says it this way. So then I have seen the wicked buried, those who used to go in and out of the holy place, but did not thereby escape their doom. And they are praised in spite of their evil and soon forgotten in the city where they did such things. This too is futility, vanity, emptiness. Of course, that's a recurring theme of this book, Ecclesiastes, <clears throat> that everything apart from a relationship with God, turns out to be meaningless and emptiness, vanity, as Solomon says. Verse 12 says, Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. This is the principle of reaping and sowing. If you do do well, if you do the right things, then uh, uh, more than likely you're going to you're going to be blessed. 
Of course, we know there are exceptions. That there are cases where bad things happen to good people. Uh, read the book of Job. You'll understand that. I did a study on the book of Job. Uh, so uh, you can watch that if you like. Verse 13 in the KJV says, But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. Verse 13, let me read that in the Amplified. <clears throat> but it will not be well for the evil man, nor will he lengthen his days like a shadow, because he does not fear God. So if you're wicked, you, you're not going to be blessed with a long life. More than likely, your wickedness will catch up with you. Your life will be shortened. It will there will be a, a cost, a cost for your for your wickedness. Verse 14 in the KJV says, There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men un, unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. <clears throat> well, it's kind of like a, a riddle to me. Let me see if the Amplified makes it easier to understand. Verse 14 in the Amplified says, There is a meaningless and futile thing which is done on the earth, that is, there are righteous men whose gain is as though they were evil, and evil men whose gain is as though they were righteous. I say that this too is futility, meaningless, vain. Uh, as I said earlier, there, there is a principle called reaping and sowing. But I used to always refer to it as the law of reaping and sowing. But as it says here in this verse here, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes it says there are righteous men whose gain is as though they were evil and vice versa. Uh, and again, that's what happened to Job. Job was the most, most righteous man in the world. And look at the horrible suffering he had to go through. So even though it is uh, commonly true that you will reap what you sow, there are exceptions. And you should not assume that every time, and if, you, if you look at a person's life, or even if you look at your own life, if, if bad things are happening, don't assume. It's a necessarily a result of, of uh, uh, their bad actions and decisions. I made that mistake with some people I've loved in the past, thinking that their, uh, their circumstances, their poverty, their bad help <clears throat> was kind of, they made their bed and now they're suffering in it because of uh, a bad, bad health habits, bad financial decisions. <clears throat> Yet, uh, let's not, Let's not be have hard hearts and not have sympathy for those people who are suffering, even if they did cause it themselves. Verse 15. Then I commended mirth because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. For that uh, shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life, which God giveth him under the sun. <clears throat> Solomon is, is, is he's um, gone through all these experiences, many marriages, uh, many uh, uh, many great accomplishments, great wealth, all these things, and nothing satisfied him. He always concluded that it was just meaningless. It didn't give him happiness, contentment, or something missing. And now he's talking about mirth, eating and drinking, being merry. And that doesn't satisfy him either. Verse 15 in the, in the KJ, 
I'm sorry, in the Amplified says, then I commended pleasure and enjoyment because a man without God has no better thing under the sun than to eat to, and to drink and to be merry. For this will stand by him in his toil through the days of his life, which God has given him under the sun. So if people don't have this relationship with God that they were created for, then, uh, you know, they, they seek to get some kind of satisfaction in life any way they can. But Solomon concluded that all these other ways are really are meaningless. Verse 16, when I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with my with his eyes. I better read that in the Amplified. When I applied my mind to know wisdom and to see the activities of mankind that take place upon the earth, how some men seem to sleep neither day nor night, and I saw all the work of God, I concluded that man cannot discover the work that is done under the sun. And verse 17 in the KJV says, Then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, farther, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. And verse 17 in the Amplified says, and I saw all the work of God. I concluded that man cannot discover the work that is done under the sun. Well, with science, you know, we are trying to understand everything. Scientists and uh, secularists, atheists, they think that, well, eventually man will know everything. Uh, it's just that man will man is going to be able to to understand everything eventually we acquire all knowledge there's, a, there's an answer to everything just be patient and science will give us all the answers but it says here a man cannot discover the work that is done under the sun there's something you're never going to know well, you know you could study philosophy and science and even theology you're not going to know everything even though man may labor in seeking he will not discover only god is omniscient even in eternity those of us who trust jesus and live on in eternity in the kingdom of god on the new heavens and new earth even then man will never be omniscient will never know everything he will not discover and more than that Though a wise man thinks and claims he knows, he will not be able to find it. <clears throat> yeah, uh, learning is a great joy. I, I didn't understand the joy of learning most of my life, really, uh, un until I got saved uh, about almost 30 years ago. Uh, you know, all my education, I, I did it grudgingly because I needed an education and it wasn't a joy pursuing it. But, but uh, studying the scriptures for 29 years now, uh, there's a joy in learning and understanding the word of God. Uh, but I'll never know everything. And, and I look forward to all eternity continuing to learn forever and ever and ever. Because when I learn, it's just, it is such a pleasure. Uh, so I have that to look forward to. <clears throat> I'll, I'll get into the next chapter, uh, chapter uh, nine, nine on Ecclesiastes next time. But I want to take a minute now to tell you about the free gift of salvation. Um, there, there's a word that you've probably heard. It's a Greek word, gospel. Did you know the word gospel literally means good news <laughs> so I have good news for you I want to share the gospel the good news with you now 
The gospel is simply that God loves us so much that he, he de doesn't desire that any of us should perish, but that we should all have eternal life in heaven. So God offers this to everyone as a free gift from Jesus Christ. Uh, eternal life in heaven, technically that would be in the new heavens and the new earth forever. Having joy and bliss and happiness forever in heaven, this, this will um, uh, be the greatest joy and pleasure forever and ever. And this is offered to all of us as a free gift. <clears throat> Most people don't are not familiar with this, though. Free gift theology, the, the, the Christianity that we find in the Bible. When I tell people that salvation is offered to all of us as a free gift, they're amazed. Because you, you don't learn this in most churches. And you certainly don't learn that this in uh, all the religions of the world. They all teach that in order to go to heaven, that, that uh, you must earn it. Through, through good works. You, you must abstain from sin and, and do a lot of good works. And if you're successful at that, it, if, you, if you merit salvation, then, then God will give it to you. They think that salvation is determined by personal merit. But that's not biblical Christianity. Uh, the Bible tells us that we cannot earn salvation. It's impossible. Uh, the standard we would have to meet is perfection. And the Bible says none of us are perfect. We've all sinned. None of us could ever go to the judgment before God and say, I was perfect. I never did one thing wrong. I never even had a bad thought. None of us can do that. Uh, and yet that's, that's the, the success that you must have if you want to earn salvation. That's what the Bible says. You don't get there through some, uh, you know, uh, partial uh, success. Uh, well, I was pretty darn good. It's, you know, the Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. <clears throat> but the good news is that even though we cannot do it, man is a failure. We could never be perfect. Uh, Jesus Christ loves us so much that he is God Almighty and he came down from heaven and became a man. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior. He said he became a man so he could die. And that's what he did. His purpose of coming from down from heaven was to die for our sins. He died on a cross. And in that manner, he did pay for all the sins of the whole world. And then he was buried. And after three days being dead in the tomb, he raised himself back to life bodily. And he, he walked on the earth bodily for 40 days among 500 witnesses. And they, they saw him and talked to him and touched him and ate with him. And the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the sign that Jesus promised it to prove his claims were true. He claimed that he is God, that he is the Savior, that he is the sole source of life everlasting. And he promises life everlasting to you if you'll trust him. You've got to trust Jesus instead of trusting yourself. Put your faith in Jesus. Stop putting your faith in your own ability to work your way to heaven. Admit defeat and say, I can't do it. I can never be perfect. And that's why I need Jesus. And when you come to that conclusion and you trust Jesus, he gives you eternal life as a free gift. And the Bible says that once you've received this gift through faith in Jesus, that this is irrevocable and irreversible. You, you could never lose your salvation no matter what. So you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven because you trusted Jesus Christ. And if you once you understand that, and once you receive this gift, you should be joyful every day for the rest of your life. I hope you do put your faith in Jesus now. And if you do make a, well, you can't make a comment on the video, but send me a private message if you, if you like. <clears throat> I hope you will join me for these live broadcasts whenever possible. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.